Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. That was never five seconds. <laughs> hey, the, the, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer. Well, this is, uh, this is a real, real special treat tonight because we have two legends in the hobby with us on the live stream, Julian Sprung and Charles Delbake. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Are you Keith? Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. So let's uh, let's do a little background here. <clears throat> for those of you that don't know, uh, Julian and Charles. Ju uh, Julian and Charles are very, very well known for co-authoring a revolutionary series of books called <laughs> The Reef Aquarium. There are three volumes. And I think Tulio from Reef Bright, who uh, many folks know, summed it up very well on Instagram today, he said that um, Charles and Julian are not only two incredibly nice people, but they are two people who played a significant role in the reef aquarium industry as we know it today. And I, I couldn't agree more with those those words. So it's a really true privilege, gentlemen, to have you both on together for the live stream. Just some more background on Julian and, and Charles. Julian has published other books and written numerous articles about the hobby he co-founded to his company two little fishies with um daniel ramirez back in 1991 julian is also a frequent speaker at aquarium conferences and club events besides being an author charles is currently the curator at steinhardt aquarium in san francisco california charles was also the driving force behind organizing the first ever magna in 1989 which was held in toronto where he lived Previously, Charles was, a, was an aquatic biologist at the Waikiki Aquarium. All right, so, uh, gentlemen, before we start chatting, I want to do a little, uh, take care of a little uh, business and thank our sponsors, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. I appreciate the support those companies um, are providing for the live stream and the channel. And I also appreciate the support of you folks, the viewers. I see a whole ton of people are, um, are tuning in. So if you haven't already, please hit that like button so more people can find that stream. And this is really a, a great, great opportunity to ask, um, ask away in terms of questions because I, I know I, we were talking before uh, guys on the, uh, before the live stream started, this is really kind of the first ever time you've been on a live stream together, correct? 
That, that is, is correct. correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So um, it's uh, depending on how it goes, the bigger or less. I don't know. <laughs> and like you said, a great opportunity to ask questions. I don't know if we'll answer them, but you can definitely ask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's um, let's start it out this way. Um, since you guys last wrote Volume Three in the Reef Aquarium series, what do you think has changed the most in in the hobby, really, in terms of methods for running a reef tank, or has anything really changed? Mm. Oh, a lot has changed, I would say. I think, uh, I think our volume three kind of uh, was sort of one of the first indications of some of the changes that were going to be coming, such as LED lighting. You know, we did talk about that. Uh, that was just starting up. The, uh, the water chemistry aspect of the filtration, the compounds that are available now, uh, and then some of the biological, you know, uh, roles uh, that bacteria play, things like that. Uh, the testing, you know, the access now to, um, and, you know, mass spec, ICP, you know, it's, it, things have changed a lot. And of course, what comes with that is that people find more things to worry about and obsess about. Um, and, and how much of that is really important, you know, I don't know. Good? Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we really, that, that time that we finished uh, volume three, which was 2005, um, you know, LEDs were just uh, coming into play. Um, and, you know, I would agree that the uh, testing that we see now uh, is offering kind of a new window, but at the same time, like you said, it's uh, giving people um, something to worry a little bit more about. But uh, for the in the right circumstances, having the extra knowledge of of what's going on chemistry wise, that that can be beneficial, um, and it and it is a change. Additionally. Um, you know, although it's older technology, the the use of algal filters um, has sort of waxed and waned in in the hobby. And I, I think that uh, the new acceptance of, on the one hand, uh, ketomorpha reactors, and on the other hand, turf scrubbers, um, is a change uh, since 2005. I mean, we knew about them back then. Recognition. Uh, and acceptance in the hobby uh, recently compared to that time. Um, I, I agree that the bacterial aspect, which I, I know was among the questions that Keith had had proposed to us, um, that area is, is still kind of a, a black box for the hobby, and and it it's something that um, you know more and more discoveries have happened and will continue to happen. Uh, understanding microbially what's what's going on in our aquariums. And I think another big change is also the availability in terms of propagation yeah. and, and the different colors and specimens that are available. You know, when we did volume one, which was back in 1994, we had a very short chapter on stony corals because they're just, the necropora was just a few specimens <clears throat> because there just wasn't much of it out there. And now it's it's unbelievable the uh, the variety and the colors and how much of it is being traded within the hobby and, and fragmented and so on and so forth. Right, that's yeah. been a huge leap. Yeah, what do you guys yeah. what do you guys think in terms of all the uh, the crazy names and prices now of um, you know SPS frags out there? It's uh, it certainly certainly has um, got them. You know, it's just kind of gone crazy. I'm sure well, Julian wishes he had his coral farm still. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I don't have one, but. Um, yeah, my, my comment on all the crazy names and prices, uh, I think it's magnificent how that has inspired uh, the growth in the hobby. That, you know, you put a name to a thing and people get excited about it. They want to collect it. They want to keep it and cherish it and all and propagate it. Um, that's been a real plus for the hobby. Uh, the negative side, of course, is the increase in cost, which potentially, you know, could scare people away. So, um, you know, it, it, it's a double-edged sword, but, but nevertheless, the hobby has grown a lot uh, since we started, and, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, propagating corals uh, was around when we finished Volume 3, but uh, 
it, it's blossomed so beautifully with, with a number of not only just farms, but uh, people in the industry making, uh, you know, really big additions, uh, both for corals and even with fishes, of course, too. Well, I, and I think the other thing that <clears throat> is basically shown is the domestication of the hobby. It's yeah. like so many other animals that have become domesticated. You have different strains and, you know, different uh, different names, and they're all popular names. None of them are scientific names. No one calls a, you know, a cocker spaniel by its scientific name because basically they're all the same. But, you know, my point is that it's it's sort of, it's more of a mainstream kind of thing now that everyone, they got all these common names, and we basically have domesticated it because it, they're all the same species of a cropper, for example, they're just different color morphs. Okay. And scientific, sorry, sorry for interrupting Keith, but uh, the scientific names have practically all changed since then too, <laughs> you know, um, which could be really confusing for, for hobbyists, but, um, you know, it's something to be understood, the, the relationships among uh, the different corals um, and anemones and the various invertebrates uh, have been studied, you know, based on now D DNA analysis as opposed to just uh, physical features that were used for taxonomical differentiation. And, and so relationships change and names change and, you know, it started with just a few and now it's almost everything. Uh, big changes in, in just 15 years. You know. Yeah. So let's, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the, uh, the name game is really pretty, um, pretty, pretty crazy. And there's, um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people out there that are naming corals that they're are just getting renamed. So there's, there's, I guess, uh, maybe original names are getting put onto corals and then, and, uh, you know, then they're getting renamed into something else. And then before you know it, uh, you're getting lookalikes and, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to kind of keep track of all that stuff. But, um, so let, let's get back to the um, to the bacteria dosing because this is something that um, you know you guys mentioned um, you know that we'll, you know, it was kind of one of the topics that we wanted to talk about um, tonight and it's it's something that certainly was not on my radar until recently and I, I started doing a little experimenting myself this past summer in terms of bacteria dosing <clears throat> you know I, I guess one of my um, you know thoughts is like you know, why is it necessary? And, um, you know, is it because the equipment that we have today in terms of skimmers and filtration systems are just so darn efficient that they are pulling, you know, bacteria out that needs to be replenished. But, um, you know, when I had, um, uh, Dr. Sanjay Yoshi on, you know, he was, uh, wondering, well, you know, show me the data, show me the data in terms of the bacteria that are actually getting pulled out and that we need to supplement. I mean, what do you, what do you guys think of all that in terms of, is bacteria dosing something that we need to do today um, because of the equipment being so much more efficient or for some other reason? Or was that just something that wasn't on the radar back when you guys were writing the, uh, you know, the, uh, the series of books? You want to go first? Or you want me to go? Uh, I was going to help hoping you would go first because I, I don't really know that much about this whole thing. I mean, it sounds to me on the surface as, another excuse for someone to come up with a product. But um, <clears throat> I think, you know, Sanjay's right. Like, where's the data to show that this is an issue? I, I do know that, you know, our tanks, the diversity in our tanks is lower compared to the ocean. So it wouldn't surprise me if the bacterial populations are nowhere near as diverse as you would find on a, on a coral reef. And we also know that in the last, you know, 10 years or so, the importance of the coral, what they call the coral holobiont, has really come to the forefront about these the bacterial communities that live on coral and how important they are to the coral uh, for fighting off disease, from uh, preventing certain types of bacteria from proliferating from a nutritional standpoint. So certainly there's a, a, a something to be said for having the right types of bacteria, but what those bacteria are and, and what proportions you need to have them in, I don't know how you would go about establishing that to be able to determine what you need to add back. But I think um, you know, I read recently about someone who's offering a service where they will basically, we do this already, we can take water samples, you can run the DNA in that water sample, and it'll tell you exactly what's in that water. And I think that's a good stepping stone to say, okay, what tanks are successful? Which ones look really great and seem to be doing well, don't have disease issues? What is their bacterial profile? What do they have? You know, what genera, what species of bacteria do they have? And then compare that to a system that's not doing well. You know, maybe that will shed some light on you know, maybe some things that need to be adjusted we need to think about. 
so much for letting me go first. <laughs> <laughs> but then I thought about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Charles. Um, it, what what I wanted to say was I, I disagree with the, the proposal. Keith said that you know our, our systems are so efficient, they're removing bacteria. That's not the issue at all. Um, and I, I agree with Charles that the diversity in our, our systems in general is, is much lower than it is in the ocean. And that's, that's to be expected. Um, but I, I think that the main uh, benefit of the proposal to dose strains of bacteria would be uh, a kind of a probiotic effect, touching on what Charles mentioned uh, in the coral microbiome. You know, when, when you have uh, disease in corals, uh, oftentimes they are bacterial diseases and, and they are a sign that, that one or more strains of bacteria are, are growing or uh, proliferating too much uh, or there may be a viral component to it that is knocking back a beneficial bacteria and, and causing a, a harmful bacteria to grow a little bit more. And there's, a, there's much more complexity to that than, than I can even begin to get into. But the dosing of uh, certain known bacterial strains can be thought of as, as like probiotics, like eating yogurt and taking probiotic bacteria to balance your gut health. Uh, and this is balancing the health of the aquarium. Uh, Charles is right. If we knew what strains are associated with a healthy aquarium or a healthy coral, then we would be able to uh, select those and, and dose them to help uh, exclude others. Um, it's a simple concept, uh, but more complex when you get down to the nitty gritty. I think we're going to be looking at this for many decades. Uh, you know, it's it's um, it's interesting because there's a, a there's a service out there now, Aquabiomics, where you could actually you know test the profile of the bacteria in in the uh, in the tank. Um, you know, that's a lot of information, and um, you know, I I, uh, I was able to get a test myself, so it's 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 interesting to see the uh, the profile in terms of the diversity of the bacteria and the and the um, I guess you can't get to, down to the specific species of the bacteria, but you can see certain groups of them. If I'm correct. Does it give you an idea of what the what the um, percentage is of the population? Yes, um, and I think it it kind of gives you a a sense of what you have in terms of good guy versus bad guy bacteria, if I'm not mistaken. And I, I wanted to mention that um, bacteria are off good guy and bad guy, and there there can be triggers that that make a, a bacteria virulent under certain conditions. Um, so it, it's not a matter of either or. Um, it, it's more complex than that. Yeah, there's that bacteria that was a study a few years ago that they named it um, Fibrio coralliticus. It was found off the east coast of Africa. And at one temperature is perfectly fine, but you raise that temperature a few degrees and it becomes virulent. Yeah. So should should we, I mean, I guess there's just, you know, we, we've already mentioned this, but there's not a lot of specific information in terms of the back, type of bacteria that we see in our tanks. And uh, yet we do, um, you know, some of us do dose bacteria. And, um, you know, but do we know what we're actually dosing in terms of the back, that bacteria? And, and if we're, go ahead, Julian. Yeah. Well, you know, there, some of the bacteria that are dosed are are part of the nitrification cycle. Yep. And so they're, you know, it's known that they have this function. Right. Uh, and, you know, it, it's beneficial to do that. It's not because the aquarium, uh, you know, somehow is missing these bacteria, but um, there is competition all the time. And there are, are organisms that feed on the bacteria uh, so dosing known uh, species that, that are participating in the nitrogen cycle or breaking uh, down organic matter, uh, these things can benefit, uh, you know, Charles doesn't believe this, right? <laughs> he just ran out. <laughs> he had something to take care of, but um, the, you know, that's been done for um, just to maintain proper So if but there's also that aspect you touched on, Julie. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, about that, it's a food source. So you know you're adding this material, and you're 
you know, some of it's probably being consumed. You know, there's certain uh, sponges or bacterial, you know, phages and uh, tunicates as well. You know, so these things are, you know, a bacteria serves as a food source for those animals. Um, and you also have your fractionator, which pulls out bacteria. So you could be dosing this bacteria, then a lot of it could be either being consumed or removed as well. And, so and how much of it is actually working? While it's in the water, of course, it may be assimilating uh, some nutrients from the water so that when the skimmer pulls it out, you you know, you have a, a form of filtration, which is the, the basic concept of, you know, bio pellet reactors and, and using skimmer. Yep. With. Yep, absolutely. It's, an, it's another form of way. That's I think that some of these products is how what they advertise what they do is that's why they do it because they basically do reduce your phosphate and nitrate levels and because the bacteria are reproducing and growing and they're absorbing that plus who knows what else. Yeah, I actually had uh, in and so I'm dosing it in two of my systems, my two of my my two systems, and I, I had Cato one in a uh, refugium and one in a al, you know algae reactor, and I took both offline because the um, you know, the, the bacteria dosing was uh, managing the nutrients without, uh, you know, the, the need to have the Kato on there. So, you know, I, I kind of felt that was a, a plus for me because every now and then Kato can, can crash. It can also, you know, require a little maintenance on, um, you know, on the reef keepers part. So I thought that uh, that is one, certainly a, a benefit of bacteria dosing. But uh, yeah, you know, I, the health of my tanks have been really, really good. So it's it's kind of hard to, to to say that the bacteria dosing has um, has been um, you know one of those things that have, that have helped the tank along, but I haven't seen any negative effects. But uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, I've been keeping reef tanks for almost thirty years, and I've never dosed bacteria. Never even thought about it. And um, yeah, so it's it's uh, it's interesting. But I think certainly I would love to see more um, more information out there in terms of the uh, specifics, in terms of the benefits, and whether actually it is necessary. So it's almost like you're skipping that step for carbon dosing, right? Because the whole purpose of carbon dosing is to provide a carbon source for the bacteria, which then grow, multiply, absorb the nutrients, and then remove by fractionation. So now instead you're just you're skipping that step. You're just adding the bacteria already. Yeah, and and you you mentioned carbon dosing, Charles. That's one thing that I've um, I've never done, and I don't think I would have the um, the uh, the nerve to do because it scares me. I think that's kind of like putting the bacteria on on the, you know supercharging those bacteria, and, and I think that's uh, you're playing a little Russian roulette. At least myself, I don't have the uh, the, uh, the the gumption to try that, but I know a lot of folks have done that. Um, so let me ask you another question. Uh, I think Julian, you you mentioned uh, RTN or, or 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 some events in the tank that um, might show some stress in the corals. If if uh, you're getting an RTN and STN event, is that pretty much a a, a bacteria related um, thing that's going on? And and should a reef keeper at this point in time think about dosing bacteria, or should should you be uh, thinking about doing something else if you've gotten a uh, an RTN or an STN event going on in your tank? Uh. Oftentimes, RTN, STN, squeaky, squeaky. I guess that's the dog there, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, we have to see that puppy. Oh, it's a puppy. Okay. <sighs> Not quite anymore. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> How old? 13 weeks. Oh, 13 wow. months. <laughs> wow. That's a beautiful. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But anyway, RTN and STN, um, oftentimes bacteria, uh, not always. Um, the main other thing that can cause that are protozoans. Um, and oftentimes it's both protozoans and bacteria. So um, it, it's complex again to, to be able to figure that out. It, uh, when you see sort of gelatinous tissue, there you can be sure there's some uh, protozoans in it. You can take a pipette, scoop it, you know, or a, a turkey baster, suck it off, put it under a microscope. And if you see, you know, thousands and thousands of buzzing around, moving things, you know that protozoans are involved. And generally the best thing to do in that case is to use a siphon and siphon off the uh, necrotic tissue, uh, that brown jelly as we call it. Um, 
and treatment for that can include antibiotics, but also, uh, you know, just, uh, anti-protozoal medication like metronidazole can be helpful. Uh, there are some publications you can find online that talk about um, treating uh, protozoan infections in corals as well as bacterial infections. Um, in general, uh, you really do need the antibiotics to stop them cold. Once in a while, you get lucky and, and um, you know, especially a slow tissue necrosis uh, can stop and, uh, you know, without any inter intervention. I want to mention that sometimes hobbyists will confuse uh, slow tissue necrosis with an infection when it's not. Sometimes corals respond in a way that looks like STN uh, as a response to um, lighting, you know, they're not getting enough light on one section or poor nutrition, um, not getting enough food and they'll recede. Uh, so in those cases, uh, reorienting the coral, increasing the light or increasing food can solve the problem. Uh, but when it's, it's rather sudden and, you know, the, it's kind of obvious when a coral has an infection, you know, they shut down and the tissue, you know, falls apart. Um, and that's when you really need to get in there and do something, whether it's treating with iodine or with antibiotic. Yeah. So we've also done a lot of work on histology of corals that we've had issues with. And what we've found also, there's fungal infections, uh, fungal hyphae that they'll find growing into the tissue. So that's that's also, I think, something that a lot of people are not aware of, that it's not always a bacteria, but the fungal can also cause the same kind of issues. Yeah. So uh, Reef the Sea Forever is asking, will UV kill the protozoa? Uh, if they, the protozoans pass through the UV, yes, but not on the coral. And even if they pass through the UV, unless it's a strong enough dose, it won't. Yeah. I mean, a, a protozoan is much, much, much larger than a bacterium. So the dosage required to kill a, uh, for a paramecium, I, I believe it's something like 60,000. I don't know what the, forget what the units are, whereas for a bacteria, it's like 10,000. So, you know, if you're treating a protozoan, that's why, you know, it's not always a great uh, tool to use for uh, cryptocarrion or any kind of protozoan parasite on a fish because they're just too large in, the, in most hobbyist UV units. For the most part, all of them really are, are not strong enough to be able to do that impact. So this this could be a good transition for a uh, for another. I knew this was coming. Oh, uh, okay. I knew that was your lead in. <laughs> <laughs> you know what's next there, huh, Charles? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, and I know we've got Chris from ASA Aquaculture is in the house uh, tonight listening. And, and um, you know, he's been on the show and we've talked about this. So, And I had, um, I've had a couple of guests talk about this. And, and uh, the topic is, uh, you know, does the lack of UV and LEDs, um, can that impact the long-term health of corals? So, you know, Mike Paletta was wondering whether the lack of UV light and his uh, LEDs was contributing to the possibility of more pathogens that could potentially cause the RTN and STN. Um, Tulio, I already mentioned Tulio at the beginning of the uh, the live stream. He was actually from ReefRite. He was actually at Mike's house with a uh, photo spectrometer, as well as at uh, Chris's place at ACI Aquaculture, and found that the LED fixtures on, on over their tanks that he tested did not have any UV light that penetrated down to corals. So, you know, the question that we've been talking about, and I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this, is that, you know, over the long haul, do you think corals require UV? Specifically, I believe we're talking about the UVA and the UVB light. Mm. That question has existed for as long as we've had a reef aquarium hobby. And I remember... Back in the day, <laughs> remember John Burleson talking about this? When we had hair. <laughs> yeah, when we had hair. Yeah, and so there were hobbyists, some, a few, who uh, got UV emitting uh, fluorescent tubes and uh, put them over their tanks to see what harm or benefit uh, would come of it. And boy, did the corals react badly to that. <laughs> it's like, uh, you know, Going uh, to the 
solar <laughs> tanning salon and not uh, having proper protection. Um, so it, it's, you know, the scientific literature shows that UV wavelengths are important, uh, at least for certain corals, uh, especially ones that occur in shallow water. Um, but, you know, when you just say UV is important, you really need to know how much, what intensity and, and what wavelengths. Um, because if you go too much to, and for what length of time, so photo period intensity, um, it, it's a whole subject that has to be very, very carefully studied to be able to make a recommendation. Um, I think the LEDs generally don't produce the UV because it would, it would destroy that um, material that's on the front side of the, the UV, it would turn it yellow. Um, but I know there are UV emitting LEDs now. I don't know what the lifespan is. Um, there you go. Right. So this is this is one that's used in mineralogy to to look for fluorescent corals. It's uh, 365 nanometers. So there definitely are UV producing yeah. LEDs out there. There's ones that can go even lower. Um, they're super expensive though. Those lamps are. Um, and, you know, I think just to backtrack a little bit, not to to interrupt Julian for too long, but I think it's important that we establish the fact that there are three wavelengths here we're talking about. There's the UVA, which is just below violet light. There's UVB, which is the one that causes skin cancer. And there's UVC, which doesn't even reach the Earth's surface because we have an atmosphere. So the only way you're going to get a UVC on your tank is if, as Julian said, someone puts a UVC light over their tank, or you have, and, I, and I, I watched the videos that you have on your channel, Keith, about this, and there was a mention of uh, measuring UVC. And I think that was probably just a, a misspoken quote because there's no way you're going to get UVC unless you have a metal halide double-ended lamp that doesn't have a glass fixture, mm. a glass lens in that fixture, because the glass blocks out the UVC. And going back to what Julian was saying, we had, I remember years ago, I had a, gentleman in our aquarium society in Toronto who, who stood up and had a question or a question answer period. He said, my, my soft corals, they're just dying in my tank. I can't keep them alive. Uh, they look like they're melting like wax on my rocks. So I went over and looked at his tank and he had uh, fixtures on his tank from Germany that were double-ended metal halides, 250 watts, with no glass lens. Mm. So he was getting UVC coming through there. Um, I did that once a local... long, long time ago yeah. to try to increase the uh, intensity of the light on my tank, and uh, it yeah. burned everything. Yeah. yeah, and then you have the mogul lamps, which have a glass envelope around that central element, so they block the UVC already right there. But if some people have if you've seen these bulbs fail, there's a hole in the side of the envelope or whatever, then you're going to get UVC coming through. Uh, and if you, again, if you don't have a glass lens under that, because a lot of people used to take the glass lens off the mogul because they got covered with salt or whatever. Yep. Um, then you'll get UVC as well. So UVC is not the UV that we're talking about here for corals. Um, so I, I think, you know, and as Julian says, the scientific literature has shown that, you know, corals can use that UV light and they actually channel it through their photosystem into a usable form of energy that they can then use for photosynthesis. And we do know that UV A and B travel quite far under the water. Yeah. I think a lot of these things with uh, metal halides versus LEDs is that uh, the other piece of the puzzle is here is intensity. And I don't know that we are getting quite the same intensity, the same kind of punch that behind an LED that you get with a UV. So the UV is, uh, I'm sorry, with a metal halide. So the metal halides definitely have not only more UV, but more light in general is my feeling. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of factors here at play when you're comparing a tank with LED lights to a tank with metal halide. You know, LEDs are discrete channels of light, whereas a metal halide is a spectrum. So you're getting a little bit of everything. So there's a lot of differences here. So, so Chris from ACI is asking, you know, maybe the question is, what is the impact on the bacteria in the tank in terms of the, um, you know, the potential lack of UV in the LEDs? I don't think anybody has studied that. I really don't. I, that was not... Uh, I, that was the perspective of, of any studies on ultraviolet wavelengths uh, over a coral reef. I, I, can you remember something you were talking about? Yeah, I, 
I mean, a lot of the studies on, you know, kill rates for UV sterilizers is because they use UVC bulbs. And right. even with UVC, which is a much higher energy ultraviolet light than UVA or B, I mean, it takes a lot of energy to kill a bacterium. And we're talking, you know, centimeters, less than a centimeter from the from the bulb. And now you're talking about having a, bulb, a light that's, you know, a foot or two above your tank that has to go through water and is producing much less UV. Is it going to kill off bacteria? No, I don't think so. In the long term, with the low dose, could it maybe retard the growth, slow the growth? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, when you're comparing to the wild, you, you have to think about the different reef zones. Uh, you know, if we're talking about Acropora and the Indo Pacific and places where the tidal uh, range is great, then you have these corals that are exposed to full sunlight certain times of the year when the tide drops low enough and the sun is overhead. Uh, so they would be baking in, in as much UV as the tropical sun is going to throw at them. Uh, but then you could have the same species, uh, you know, 20 meters down, <laughs> um, having a very different uh, profile of, of light. Um, and, you know, we keep them in our aquariums with still different light. Uh, there, it, it would take quite a lot of study to understand what are the um, impacts of which type of wavelength of UV on the health of the coral and on the um, microbes in the aquarium. I know that when we were writing volume one, we did a lot of research on that at that time. And there's been a lot of literature that was coming out of the University of Hawaii, the effects of UV on reefs and what animals were tolerant, what were not. You know, things like sponges, tunicates can't take it at all. That's where you find them in the crevices where the light is it's getting to them. Um, and I think, you know, also corals have natural sunscreen. They're called microsporine-like amino acids, MAAs. And they're apple, they actually, it's like um, poison dart frogs. You know, if you, if you have, t you know, bred poison dart frogs in your home, they're not poisonous because they get it from the diet from the natural diet that they eat in the wild. So in the wild, they're poisonous, but if you domesticate them, then they're not poisonous anymore. But so, and with the corals, they also produce the MAAs in conjunction with the amount of UV they get. So the deeper they are, the less MAAs they produce. And I'm sure that in tanks that have very little UVA, they wouldn't be producing anything. And that's why if you all of a sudden take your shield off your tank, off your light, you could fry your corals. They just don't have any natural protection. So it, it, it sounds to me like the jury is kind of out on that question in terms of the um, potential impact on coral health over the long term with using LEDs. It, it, you know, it does seem like a lot of people have had a lot of success with LEDs over the long haul. I, I want to say that you know, there's no doubt that LEDs uh, reproducibly grow corals for years and years and years. There's no... Uh, there's no real missing the UV in that sense. Uh, you don't find that the corals do well for a year or two and then decline. No, no, no. We've, uh, I mean, the whole hobby has shifted to LEDs, um, mostly. There's a couple of stragglers out there. Ah, keep my old yeah, metal halide. Me. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, no problem with that. Uh, I've still got a couple of metal halides here and there, but uh, mostly LEDs now. And yeah, I mean, the corals grow and thrive. For well, what I would like to, you know, you could try it. These people that claim that, well, I need to, I put a metal halide back on my tank with my LEDs and so everything's better now. Take a take a reptile light that only produces UVA and UVB and put that over the tank and yeah. see if you get the same kind of response. Uh, and if you see it you know, with caution. <laughs> yes, do that too. Short, short photo period, really, yeah. really short photo period. I wouldn't advise this for a home hobby of somebody with, with their prized tank, but someone that has a coral farm or has multiple troughs or tanks and wants to experiment, that would be an interesting experiment, is to use a light that only produces UVA, B, and one with metal halide and see if there's a difference between the two sources. Um, that would be telling, I think, to yeah. see whether it's the metal halide and the other changes, you know, the other differences it has with an LED, or is it strictly the UV that's the cause of this increased performance? So I, I, I definitely want to 
throw some questions at you guys from the uh, from the viewers and and certainly folks if you uh, if you have any questions for Julian and Charles please uh, drop them in the chat but reef the, reef the sea forever had a uh, question earlier on in the stream that um, I'd like to get to and, and it's got to do with um, you know with dosing and um, the question is do we need to to, uh, to dose strontium is that something that we need to dose on a regular basis to a reef tank yeah what what is uh Dr. Schimmick say about that. <laughs> it's in toothpaste. It's in toothpaste. It's right. No, I, I remember um, way back when, I mean, how long, it's got to be more than 20 years ago that, that um, Ron Schimmick wrote, um, you know, I mean, it was a groundbreaking piece to just take the opposing point of view and say, hey, we don't need to be dosing strontium. Um, I disagreed with him at that time and consistent as I am, I still disagree with him on that one. Uh, there are many points uh, upon which I do change my mind and change my opinion. But um, on that one, uh, what I can say is, look, if, you're, if you've got a tank with zoanthids and corallomorphs and, you know, not a lot of stony corals in there, the dosing of strontium it, is not necessary. But if you're growing... Um, building stony corals, a lot of Acropora, they're being pulling that strontium out. So just like you replenish calcium and alkalinity, you're going to need to replenish strontium unless you're changing water. Um, it, it will go down. And I think that the uh, ICP analysis uh, that's being done now could show that easily. Back in the day when when uh, Dr. Schimmick wrote that, <laughs> it's so funny. Is that your stomach or the dog, Charles? <laughs> I know. Um, back in the day, uh, I, I had um, asked one of the salt manufacturers, could they make me up a batch of salt uh, that was strontium-free? And unfortunately, um, it never came to be. Nobody uh, produced that for me. I could do that now. Uh, and we could do some tests to see you know, what happens if you maintain uh, an aquarium uh, without strontium additions. You know, you do you do get some strontium uh, from uh, Kalkwasser dosing, or if you use a, a calcium reactor, of course, you're going to get some strontium that way. Um, but you know, if you start with a base seawater mix that is strontium free, uh, the question is what what happens to the corals? Do their skeletons grow more slowly? Are they more brittle? I mean, those are things that I would expect to happen, that the skeleton would not be as, as uh, solid as, as you uh, would see in an aquarium with normal seawater strontium levels. So, I, do, Rick, do you remember, Julian, way back when you had your little 15-gallon tank and you were trying to grow Cervicornis? Yeah. This was back in the late 80s, and we were... I was co I was corresponding with Dietrich Stuber, Dietrich yeah. Stuber in in Berlin, and he mentioned that they were adding strontium. So you tried it, yeah. And lo and behold, lo and the be artist did great. That after correct. that, that is, and, for, and that was the moment that sold me on strontium. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and you know stront we did a lot of we did some research on that as well, and, and in the literature looked at it. And one of the things I did find was that it is incorporated also into coral and algae. And so it is, a, even if you have a soft coral tank or whatever, and you want coral in, the strontium does help with that as well. Um, it is incorporated by the, the uh, anything that calcifies, really. Right. In here at the, at the Steinhardt, uh, we make our own salt mix. And originally we were adding strontium chloride, but our strontium was usually around 15 parts per million. It was higher than we wanted it. So we eliminated the extra strontium chloride and still we, our tank runs around 10 parts per million, eight to 10. And it's it's most likely, it's, we have calcium reactors, of course, we do water changers, but in our mix, um, some of those components probably has strontium as a contaminant. Yeah. And that's that was our conclusion. So we don't actively add it because we know that it, by through water testing, we've done ICP analysis, we've done the city of San Francisco was able to measure for it, and we found that it was it was always fine. Um, so I, that would be the only reason I would say that you don't need to dose it. If you're testing, if you're, you know, testing monthly or every couple of months with ICP and you're showing your strontium isn't really changing, 
then whatever it is you're doing, whether it's water changes or your the media you're using, your calcium reactor, whatever it is, it's maintaining that level. Um, but I will say that you know, in, in smaller systems with a high coral load, it's going to go up. It's going to drop out pretty quickly. Right for a coral farm, I think it would be essential. Yeah. Um, there's a difference between a display and a coral farm. So for for like a general display, I mean, Julian, you mentioned a lot of water changes. What would be your definition of a lot of water changes? So in other words, um, doing enough water changes where you're potentially replenishing that strontium versus actually having to dose it directly. That depends on the bio load, the amount of coral in the in the system. You can't really put a number on that, but um, you know, I mean, a lot of water change would be, you know. Uh, 10% a week or, you know, something like that. Some people do that kind of thing. Yep. Uh, if you're, you know, if you were doing that kind of level, then probably that'd be sufficient for a display tank. Um, Back in uh, 2007, there was the International Coral Husbandry Symposium that was held in the, the Burgers Ocean in, in Arnhem in the Netherlands, where a bunch of public aquariums got together from all over the world to talk about keeping corals. And um, there was a paper that was published from that symposium by Max Janssen, uh, who's the curator at that aquarium, where he basically didn't add anything to the tank for a month and measured it every week. And what he got from that was his calcium demand and his alkalinity demand. And so you can figure out how much is this tank using and how much do I need to then to add to keep up with that. And you can do the same thing with strontium or any of those elements, really. Um, and I think that's that's something that you know maybe somebody who's got multiple systems and wants to have an experimental and try like uh, you know and wants to experiment with that and to play around with it, that might be something worth trying. Is just don't add anything for a week or two and just measure your values every day and see how quickly things drop, and that will give you a very strong indication of what the demand is for calcium and alkalinity and strontium. It's an indication, but it's not precise because once the corals slow down, then the 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 demand slows down. So it's a. I think it depends on the where you're starting from, because right. I think you're still going to get growth, pretty good growth, at a, like a calcium level of 380. Correct. You know? Yeah. But as a, but if you're starting at 480, and right. in a week it goes down to 420. I think I don't think you're going to see much difference in growth. Yeah. So, um, what about dosing potassium? How important is potassium to maintain that in a um, in a mixed reef? I put in mashed bananas into my tank every day. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I I go ahead. You go, Julian. Um, in general, uh, potassium does not get depleted in the same scale that calcium and alkalinity do. So um, as long as the seawater mix that you're using has a, a normal natural seawater level of potassium, the dosing is not super critical. Um, if you're not doing much in the way of water changes, over time, yes, potassium does uh, drift. It does uh, fall in general. And I think that the anecdotal observation is that certain corals seem to appreciate the dosing. I think some species of Montipora are, are supposed to be sensitive to potassium levels. Is that what your experience has been? Um, yeah, I, I, the testing that we've done in potassium doesn't change much. Um, it's already, it, I mean, natural seal Natural levels are like 350, 400 yeah, parts per million. 50 to 400, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to take a long time for that to really get depleted. Um, and as Julian says, you know, food additives, any kind of additives you're putting in there, your uh, water changes, all those things will probably add it. But, you know, up, up, now with ICP, it's easy enough to measure it. So you can measure it and then you can see for yourself. You know, again, don't dose for a while and see, see how long. See what happens because I don't think it's going to drop very quickly. It's like magnesium too. That magnesium doesn't tend to drop once it stabilizes. It doesn't tend to drop very much. Yeah, in some tanks, you know, with with a lot of coralline algae, you do see uh, shifts in magnesium. But in general, it's a slow, slow change. Yeah, the initial new tanks, you know, they'll suck it up pretty quickly. 
yeah. as it coats the surfaces with these carbonate. Yeah. Once those surfaces are coated, then it really slows down. Yeah. So we've, um, you guys have mentioned water changes a few times, and, and Great Bearded Reef is uh, wants to know what do you guys feel about not doing water changes? You know, I guess there's uh, you can do the Triton method, which is uh, one way you can you know avoid water changes a, a certain way. But uh, what what it, you know in general, what do you guys feel about running a tank without doing water changes? Well, you can. Uh, and you know, the alternative methods of, of measuring and then adding the different elements is like taking a water change and breaking it up into a, a bunch of little water changes. <laughs> it really is. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, also, if a tank is running stable, uh, you don't necessarily need to do your regular water changes. Uh, if you're an experienced hobbyist, by eye, you can tell when when a system needs it. Um, your testing can also give you an indication if, if something's out of whack that could easily be uh, fixed with a water change. But, um, you know, the alternative methods, uh, I, I look at that and I think, well, which is more work? Uh, what's the easier maintenance routine? And if, if uh, not actually physically removing water, but measuring and adding a little bit of this, a little bit of that is easier for you, then that's fine. That and what's the expense difference? Right. And oftentimes it's six and a half a dozen. Yeah. And what about the things you're not measuring? Yeah. You know, what, what about those things? Yeah. Well, it's hard to quantify the things you don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that, that puts, uh, yeah. It seems like we have so much um, information at our disposal these days versus many, many years ago, but it also seems like we have a long way to go in terms of that information. Yeah. I think there's more information and there is understanding. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, all right. I want to take a couple more questions from the, uh, from the viewers. JD Reef is, um, he's got a very specific question about um, sponges. Is there any natural way of eliminating pineapple sponges that aren't a risk to SPS corals. Pineapple sponges. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm, not I'm stumped on that one. Sponge, oh, wow. But that's a common name for a sponge that, I, I assume it's an encrusting sponge that grows over corals and does harm. I, I uh, do not know the answer to that. I, that's I, the first I'm heard I'm Googling it right now. My recommendation to uh, the hobbyist is that uh, there are a number of uh, sea stars that feed on sponges. And I would give a shot at um, Linkia multiflora, which is fairly easy to find in the trade. Uh, they come in, you know, as hitchhikers on live rock, and they uh, reproduce by just fission, by breaking. Um, I keep them in, in my systems as sort of a sponge control um, and that would be one recommendation. I mean, somebody might say, oh, an angelfish. Ah, okay. Charles, you're doing this? Or Yep, I'm doing it. Let's see. So pineapple sponge, what's it? Oh, oh yeah, I, 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 those look familiar. Yeah, those little guys. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, those are little glass sponges. Yeah. They, I haven't found them to be particularly harmful, uh, but maybe some coral farm's going to say, oh, yeah, they kill my corals. I don't, I've never had trouble with those. You find them. On the undersides of Yeah, I've of seen rocks. those in my sumps. Yeah. And in the sumps. Right. Yeah. Um, I'm sure like like anything in a reef tank, something can explode and become a problem, yeah, right? Become a pest. Yeah. If you got a lot of silicate in your water, maybe. Could be, yeah, because those are glass sponges. Yeah. Uh Paula Powell, thank you very much for the uh for the super chat comment is keep bringing in great guests. And uh we certainly have two great uh guests on uh tonight. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, and, and folks certainly put some more of your uh, questions down in the, uh, Charles. oh, we've got, a, we got, uh, we got, we got somebody joining Charles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two heads. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've got another question for you guys, because this is actually something that I'm going to start doing pretty soon. And that's a, um, adding a cryptic sump to one of my systems <clears throat> and and let me explain to you why I'm, I'm doing that 
and this will be great to, to hear your thoughts in terms of what I'm doing. But so I have this, um, you know, my reef is about five years old, five years old, SPS, SPS dominant reef, tons of corals, like wall to wall, very mature. You know, it's gotten to the point where probably like 95% of the rock is covered with encrusting acros, montes, even some uh, zoanthids. So I'd like to do a, um, you know, a, a reset on the tank. I think I've got maybe 10 SPS in there that are just totally dominating and, and some Montepore that are really taking over. So I am maybe a little bored. I want to kind of mix things up and, 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 um, try something a little bit different. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous because what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out some dry rock in the tank. You know, the, the tank has the live rock, it's Haitian live rock. So I'm going to swap that out for some dry rock. And what I'm doing right now is I've got a hundred gallon Rubbermaid stock tank that I've got the dry rock cooking in. So whenever I do water changes, I put, um, you know, the established tank water into that um, stock tank. And I'm also dosing a little bacteria, whether I'm not, you know, whether that's necessary um, or not, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, my plan is to essentially soak this dry rock in this uh, stock tank for about three months and to try to, like, have the um, bacteria colonize this dry rock. And so then when I'm ready, when I'm ready to kind of make the switch out to swap out the actual live rock in the tank for this dry rock that's cooking, I'm going to do it gradually. So, you know, right now the tank has two islands in it so i'd like to kind of do it one island at a time and what i would do is i would plumb in this um cryptic sump so i've got a 60 gallon uh it's a black polyurethane tank uh, two foot by two foot by two foot and what i would do is i would take out the live rock in the display put it into the cryptic sump and then take some of that dry rock that's cooking in the stock tank and put it into the display tank. So really trying to keep all the bacteria in the tank intact in the system. And then uh, eventually, you know, make the whole swap in terms of all the live rock into that um, polyurethane tank and the dry rock into the, um, to the established tank and then run the system with that cryptic sump moving forward. I don't know if that was a, a good explanation in terms of what I'm trying to do, but it's a, it's a long-winded way of asking you guys, what are your thoughts about adding a cryptic sump to a system? Is that potentially going to be beneficial to try to keep, um, an, ha to have that as an added source of bacteria? And, um, you know, so what are your thoughts on that? Well, that was a, that was that was a, a mouthful, time. right? uh I, i'll i'll start on this first of all the, well, i see time's up now uh, Keith, yeah so, no, yeah <laughs> i've taken um, flack for this then, before in the past i've got some kind of long-winded questions so uh hopefully that wasn't uh i didn't take too long to tee that I, up I got, the whole, I got the whole picture and i'm formulating an answer at the moment uh first of all i wanted to uh, give kudos to steve tyree who i think coined the term cryptic sum um I mean, there is the, the idea in, in the scientific literature of the, the cryptic fauna in a reef that, you know, live in between the, and underneath the uh, spaces. Um, so is that beneficial? Well, the, the book that Steve Tyree wrote about it was focusing on the sponges. Oh, you got it there? It's not showing. There it is. Yep. Oh, well, in and out. It's because it's a blue screen. It kind of fades in and out. Um, yeah. Oh, there you go. There you can kind of see yep. it. Uh, and, and what he was focusing on was the, the sponges mainly, that if you put live rock in a, a sump that's not illuminated, that sponges will proliferate where you've got good water flow going through, and that those sponges serve a biological function. Um, you may or may not realize that because sponges pump water through their porous bodies, they also harbor bacteria, including nitrifying bacteria. So um, if you pass uh, ammonia containing water through a living sponge, out the other end comes nitrate. <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're like little biological filters. Anyway, your question was focused on a rebooting of your aquarium where you wanted to be cautious and not remove the established bacteria on your live rock. And you were setting up 
a sump, whether you want to call it a cryptic sump or not, but so that you would maintain the same biomass of bacteria. And I think that's a clever idea. Um, I'm puzzled. I, I was sitting here as you were explaining it, wondering why would you mess up a good thing unless you were, uh, you know, thinking of setting up another aquarium and this was your way of taking the established rock with corals and ultimately transitioning them to another aquarium. That would make sense. I would not really ever uh, take a, an established healthy reef tank and decide, oh, I'm going to change the rocks. <laughs> I, you know, I, I wouldn't do that unless uh, there was, for example, um, the ear sponge, you know, the blue uh, sponge that encrusts and, and kills corals and it was out of control in the system that I might take out certain rocks with that on uh, to get rid of that. Yep. Uh, I know people will do that for bryopsis or even for aptasia, you know, do a, a rock rotation, but um, the tank's got corallines and it's healthy and the corals are growing like crazy. Um, well, you can take the rock out temporarily and chop the corals off of it and put it back. I've done that many times in my system. Uh, I don't really ever find a reason to remove and replace rock. Um, but uh, if you were setting up another tank and you wanted to have that new tank established really well, then what you're doing makes sense. Yeah, you know, with the uh, with my situation with this tank, the um, I'm looking to get more of an open aquascape and more circulation because right now all the um, all the corals are just kind of choking out one another and it's, yeah. and it's tough. I mean, like you said, you know, one other alternative would be to pretty much go in there and, and hack away and um, yeah. try to remove as much as possible, then replant. But the issue, I guess, from, for myself is that I've got a lot of Montipore that, that have encrusted on the rock, even Acropore. So that's going to be really tough for me to chisel off. I mean, I guess I could do it, but um, so if I wanted to kind of plant new Acros in that tank, it, um, I just saw it as being a challenge, but you know, I'm not, I don't want to get rid of that rock and you know, who knows down the road in terms of reusing that rock because you can't get Haitian live rock anymore. And, um, it's good stuff. Wouldn't right. you have to chisel the Mont Tipper off that rock anyway, if you're going to put it in your sump? Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to try to, um, chisel off as much as I can. Right. Cause I don't want to have any dead matter that, um, right. could pull up Dying. Yeah, that would not be good. But um yeah, so that's that that's my plan. But um yeah, cuz you don't you don't see a lot of folks running cryptic sumps and I was just kind of curious in general is if if that's something that is um you know, something that people should consider adding to their systems or is it not even necessary? Um, I think yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think if you if you call what these people like to dose bacteria I mean, you probably would feed those sponges really well. Yeah. Um, and then there's also, there's things like for tunicus, like vanadium, and that are also important for their growth. So you would have to dose that. And then silicate is another you know, element that you would need or a compound that you would need uh, in a good, healthy level to support the sponge growing. Yeah. But... Uh, I mean, I think I was. I don't think that's the book that Steve. Steve, that book that Steve wrote that I have is all about the aquariums. I don't know if that's the actual cryptic one because I know he had another one. It yeah. was just called the Cryptic Reef or something. I have it here somewhere. Julian's got it somewhere, but uh, he talks about what the benefits of that were. But right, I, you exactly. know, any kind of a sump like that, you're going to face like detrital accumulation and that kind of stuff that you're going to have to keep under control. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. All right, another interesting question from Reef the Sea Forever. Do you guys think we worry too much now versus the old day of reefing? No. <laughs> it's about the same level of same level of worrying. About the same level. You can never worry enough. <laughs> no, there was there's, there's always somebody that's worried about something. I mean, remember the first time we met Larry Jackson was at a was at a Magna. Yeah. And he, he came up and he was like, he was so, he was like stressing out about something in his tank and, and he was really worried and should I be doing this and should I be doing that? And then he showed us pictures of his tank and we go like, 
Looks great to me. I don't know what you're what you're worried about. It seems like you're doing something right. Livian looks great. Well, I still think like I need to do this, and need to do that. Yeah, yeah. It, nothing's changed in that regard. There's always something with a reef tank. I think there's more to worry about now because, like we were just saying at the very beginning, there's more information out there. Right. So it gives even more fuel. It's like throwing big logs on a fire. Is, is there any information out there today? That um, any type of information out there today that you have seen that is sort of cringeworthy to you both? Does do, when you see something out there that um, you know that people are talking about maybe on the uh, I don't you're probably not perusing forums or whatnot, but is there any kind of information out there these days that make you uh, both cringe? Uh, something about uh, LEDs and UV, I think, was one. <laughs> <Yeah, there's something. laughs> no, 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 no. Just kidding. Joking, Mike Paletta. Just joking. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I'm sure if I were to peruse the forums, I would see something, but uh, nothing comes to mind. Um, I think it was. I, I I find that myself like when I, I I I don't peruse the forums either, but occasionally I I I'll end up somewhere and I'll be see, reading something. I always have the urge to jump in, and so I don't want to do do that. <laughs> Because if I'm on these forums, then I'll, I'll be jumping in everywhere and getting in. I've, I've been down that road, been yeah. down that road back in the 80s on, on Fishnet. Fishnet, Fishnet on Cosby, <laughs> yeah. And Later on, uh, AOL had a whole that Eric Borden was a, was a, a, a part of. So, um, you know, he was uh, one of the, uh, the moderators on that forum, too. I remember those other controversies there. No, thank you. I had my, I had my dose of that. Learned my lessons. Uh, Julian, I think you mentioned earlier that um, you've changed your opinions on some things in terms of reef keeping. Would, would you guys change anything in the in the, uh, in the the books that you uh, wrote uh, years ago based on what you know now? No, they're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been aged now and I don't, I don't remember what I wrote anymore. Right. <laughs> You're supposed to, like, on cue, boom, like that. Uh, gosh. Would I change anything that, uh, with regard to husband? Yeah. That's what you mean. Yeah. Certainly identification, is, you know, things have changed, but um, husbandry-wise. Uh, like, yeah. Go ahead. They were pretty good, actually, husbandry. Um, you know, I mean, we, we evolved uh, from volume one to volume three. Uh, we, we had, uh, you know, kind of a evolving opinion about algal filtration uh, you can see that you know we had some pretty harsh things to say about it in volume one and more more tempered and supportive in volume three um i think in volume three our the goal there was not so much as to debate things but just to present them yeah here's what people are doing here are different ways that people are having success right. and not to say that one way was better than another but just to throw it out there uh, volume one was really, you know, when I first approached Julian about that book, my my vision was that it was going to be a scientifically based book and that we were not going to be up until that point. Almost all the books that are out there were just someone's experience, somebody's opinion or a, a, a thinly disguised advertisement for somebody's company. And so what I really wanted to do was divorce ourselves from that and to give a totally objective view backing up any opinions that we did put in there to back it up with what I had found in the scientific literature. So we were trying to help explain what were the, why were we seeing the things that we were seeing? Why were we experiencing the things we we're experiencing? Well, here, when you look at the scientific literature, this is what's been found about corals in this environment. Here's what the light field is like. This is why blue light is important. This is why it penetrates further into the ocean. This is why zooxanthellae are brown, because it's the best color to absorb blue. So things like that to try to explain to people, you know, how a coral worked, how a coral reef worked in nature, and what we're trying to actually replicate. Because in order to replicate something, you need to understand it. So that was the goal in volume one. And volume three was more uh, about the techniques. And here's what people are doing. I think, you know, we were limited at that time as to what the technology was. So, you know, if we were to go back and do it now, certainly we would change a lot of things on, on the technology side of it because we've had some of this technology now for a good 10 to 20 years. So 
we'll know more about it and what works and what doesn't work. But yeah, I don't, as Jillian says, you know, I, I think you know, people have told me too that, you know, they could still use volume one and, and volume three and set up a very successful aquarium. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because it's old doesn't mean that the information's not valid anymore. It's the same with the scientific literature. Like some of the you know, things change, of course, you know, more, as more information comes to light, you learn more things. And so you have to change and adapt with that and accept it. But a lot of that scientific, early scientific literature, even from the 1920s on coral reefs, is still valid today. And a lot of uh, researchers, you know, the older researchers will point that out to the younger ones. You know, don't discount what was done before. It's just as valid today as it was then. And we see a lot of this wheel stuff where people come by and say, oh, I, you know, I just found this out. I said, well, that was actually discovered like 30 years ago. What, what about, um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about on the show about, um, I've had you know, Chris from ACI on, talked about pH and Cockwasser. You know, at one point way back when, Cockwasser was, uh, was a pretty common thing in terms of Cockwasser dosing. It seems to be back in a vogue these days. What do you guys think about uh, the trend to uh, Cockwasser and elevating pH? Yeah, I mean, that that was uh, Peter Wilkins, one of his gifts to the aquarium hobby, um, which really was one of the central uh, husbandry methods that the Berlin people used uh, to be successful in growing corals. Um, and you know, a key reason for that, aside from the obvious uh, dosing of calcium and alkalinity, uh, is the influence on pH and, and its ability to boost pH when it otherwise would be falling. So that's why it persists as a great idea. Should we be chasing pH or alkalinity? Both. Both. <laughs> yeah. They go hand in hand with calcium. Yeah. Yeah, the pH is, it's, you know, clearly important for you know, promoting calcification and, uh, and success with a, an aquarium. Um, and this is especially true because our aquariums are located indoors, you know, mm. where we've got carbon dioxide uh, accumulating uh, in most situations. There is, a, there is a concept that we discussed in volume three, which is surprising to me still, no one's really you know, aside from you know people like Craig Bingman, who probably is much better explaining this than I certainly am, um, and probably is somebody you should be talking to at some point, uh, keep on your show, yeah. um, is you know the concept of the calcium carbonate saturation state and how to calculate that. I mean that's that's where all these things come together: pH, alkalinity, carbon dioxide. It's the calcium carbonate saturation state which determines the ability of a coral to calcify. So when I worked at the Waikiki Aquarium, I mean, we used a, a saltwater well. The pH out of the well was five. Hmm. Uh, we had to aerate that in a separate chamber before we could pump it to the building. And that would bring it up to about 7.8 at the highest. And it was basically in trained CO2. That's why the pH was so low. But the calcium was only about 380. The alkalinity is 1.5 molar equivalents per liter. But when you did the math on that, we had an oceanographer by the name of, um, of Marlon Atkinson, the late Marlon Atkinson, uh, who wrote some papers based on our, the systems there. Uh, he calculated out that the calcium carbonate saturation state was at as was high enough to allow these corals to continue to calcify. So, you know, it's a balance between those. And, and again, I said it's kind of surprised that people really haven't honed in on that more and and worked out a way to for the average hobbyist to be able to calculate that easily in their system because i think that's really that's the that's the key there that's what you're trying to achieve right. so that's why people threw around with ph alkalinity what you're doing is you're changing the calcium carbonate saturation state by adjusting those things i think we covered it pretty well with craig's help in volume three yeah, I still don't understand it, though. Yeah. <laughs> is, so I guess the key question is, is there a uh, volume four in the works, or do you think uh, the age of the uh, the book is is kind of transitioned into this new age of well, how we're attaining information? Well, if somebody wants to give Julie and I both $50,000 <laughs> up front 
to yeah. write volume four because we're not going to make any money on it and we're going to spend hundreds and hundreds of hours on it, uh, then no. Make it worth our while. Right? What would uh, what would be in volume? I mean, I'm, only, I'm only partially joking here. Yeah. If somebody out there wants to pay us to do it. <laughs> Where's the cup? Here we go. Yeah, pass the cup around. GoFundMe so, site. Go Let's yeah, go start a GoFundMe go page. So what would be yeah. in volume four if there was a volume four? Any, uh, any uh, LEDs and UV, <laughs> bacterial dosing, everything we're talking pH, about today, cryptic sumps. <laughs> no. I, I, I don't, I didn't even give it much thought. I, I know there was a, there was a chapter that we never finished that for volume three that uh, we never put in because of lack of space. Yeah. Um, we ran which, a, oh, which I, I was yeah. going to write a separate book on that. I told Julian. Oh, yeah. Said, some guy in Germany beat us to it, but anyway, I, I still want to do that, believe it or not. Maybe when I retire, I'll get more thing, time. Later. The good thing is that since that time, uh, there's much more known and there are more uh, things yes. to cover. <laughs> yes, I know. There are. There's, yeah, we found some, some cool things already. So, yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm kind of digressing here. I, I would think it would be you know, updating the whole technology, basically, what's what's changed. Right. And then updating the, the you know, I mean, it's a lot of work to go through the scientific literature and because we'd be looking at how many years? It, it would take a few years to really. 20, yeah, 24 years, 27 years. Yeah, since we're 27 years of scientific literature, we'd have to catch up. That's a big on. commitment. Yeah, that's a big commitment. What about, yeah. um, what about? Okay, make that a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I think you got to up the ante a little bit there. What about uh, what about rock? I mean, back in the uh, in the day, you know, the the old formula was one pound of live rock per gallon of water. That's changed a lot. Yeah, um, I think even back then, I, I always was of the opinion that it, it's really kind of you know arbitrary to come up with a figure like that. But uh, it certainly those figures do put you in the bullseye of range of, of having success. Um, and, and the reason for that was you needed a certain minimum uh, surface area for the bacteria in the system. I think, I think that what um, some of the coral farms have done with systems with just rock and, and bare bottom and no sand um, has caught my attention because they do really sort of prove the point, you know? Um, because obviously if you had no rock and no sand, you'd be dependent on all the surfaces of the glass and pl plumbing um, to, to be your biofilter. Some people will supplement with, with uh, ceramic media or bricks or whatever, but um, I've been impressed looking at, at setups with clean bottoms and just rock, high flow, um uh you know the level of success that they have because you know it's a lot easier to achieve the biological filtration in a sand bed and then the amount of rock that you have uh, almost is nothing you know you don't you don't really need much rock at all uh, so you, you follow what i'm saying <laughs> that, that you can set up a tank with a, a two inch sand bed and, and a tiny little rock and that's a whole lot less than X pounds per gallon. Uh, but if you don't have that sand bed, then you really need to hold that thought of uh, rule of thumb more closely. Yeah, or Julian was saying that uh, you know, in the, when we first were you know, looking at those, writing those books and looking at that recommendation, I mean, one of the things that struck us immediately is like, yeah, but all rock is the same. Right, some rock is very porous, and therefore, you know, two pounds of that rock could get you ten pieces of rock, and yeah. another type of rock you get one piece. So, you know, it it really was not really a helpful number, but like Julian says, it gets you kind of in that ballpark. Uh, thanks to Rob Upstate New York for the super chat. The uh, the comment is for Keith's introduction page in volume four. Laugh out loud. So I guess uh, the contributions are starting to roll in. <laughs> but we we got a long way to go. It's only five All right. bucks. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. And someone's got to be first. That's all I got to say. There's always somebody brave soul yeah. who's going to yeah, be first. Got to get that ball rolling. Um, <laughs> Upstate New York. 
jar with a little fiber in it. <laughs> yeah, a little picture of us with a tear. Uh, All right. Well, listen, I'm not going to I'm not going to keep you guys too much longer, but um, I've got um, one more question from the uh, from the viewers, and then I got one more general question for you guys. Um, this is a very specific question from Leland Foley about, um, Oh no, the, not Leland, Leland Foley. I do it. I, I um, do know Leland Foley. Do Julian yes, or do. Charles have any tips to maintain the blue color in some of the bright blue acroporas, um, like the a young guy that Charles and Bruce had at the white Kiki aquarium. <laughs> UV light. <laughs> um, Amino acids, yeah. So, uh, and they, it has to be growing. I mean, any of these colorful acroporids, if they are growing, they will become colorful when you know you give them the right wavelengths and and food amino acids. If they stop growing, if they don't have uh, the minerals and the alkalinity that they need, then the color, yeah, goes away. Um, Another thing that affects the corals, and it's not just uh, a blue young guy, um, if you have Acropora and it's growing really well and it's colorful and then suddenly, boom, the color goes away, that is kind of a mm. warning uh, of the possibility of heavy metals. Um, I've seen it multiple times when corals overnight, you know, or one or two days, they just lose their those fluorescent colors that makes me go uh oh i gotta look is there a magnet exposed is there something some source of metals uh, is there a particular element that you're thinking of julian um, Cad cadmium or something like that well i mean it can be copper of course uh, or something i mean i i have not tied it to a specific metal uh, but I have found that when it occurs, that's when you find that mm. screw that fell in the tank or an exposed magnet, something. Um, and I, you know, don't know what it is, which metal. Um, ICP. ICP could give you an idea, but then you might have multiple metals and you don't know which one. Uh, yep. All of them or one of them, hard to say. But, um, but back to Leland's point, um, with the right intensity and wavelengths of light and strong growth and there and certainly the amino acids are are important in the development of, of bright colors whether it's and, and water flow good strong water, water motion yeah yeah that promotes that that growth as well uh -huh. and uptake of nutrients um you know just to go back to julian's point about loss of color i also see that with uh, flatworms yeah. Um, that parasite. you know, a coral will lose any kind of parasite. The coral will lose its color. It'll look brown, uh, and that can happen pretty quickly too. We had that uh, years ago with some acropora. I think it was Valida that we had a big head of it. You know, nice green tips and purple on the calices, and all of a sudden, from the bottom up, it just started turning brown. And then, on close inspection, it was covered with. How uh, um, Charles, do you handle that sort of situation when you find? Um, you know, acro eating flatworms in a, such a large system like that. How do you try to resolve that issue? We use the Ayula method, which is a big giant freshwater hose, and we just spray it off with fresh water. Um, we have tried it uh, recently. We have two large acropora heads in our uh, one of our areas of the tank that uh, get had flatworm infestation, and we we hosed them down, and then they bleached out. One of them bleached out. Uh, and then slowly didn't get any more flatworms. That's a really, and when you knock them loose like that, then the fish will come in and the wrasses in particular will eat those flatworms. That will, well, we just, I just got an email from one of my team, my team lead on the big coral tank saying they're going to dip our giant clams in oh. fresh water because they found flatworms on them. Really? And I've been doing, yeah, and I've been doing some research in, uh, you know, in Op's book and James. Fathery's book that there is a flatworm that can get up to six centimeters that they find on these on Tridacna gigas in particular. Yeah. And it will actually go inside the animal too and cause problems. So I have a photo, Julian, I'll send you later. Right. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I mean, I know there are some of these flatworms, really like big ones that that are uh, you don't see them <laughs> until the clam dies and, and that yeah, that could be. I wonder, will the fresh water 
work or stress the clam or you know the well that's my concern we've done it before for perkinsis and it seemed right. like the treatment was worth and worse than the disease yeah it's perkinsis it's a protozoan actually goes into the organs i mean it goes they found it on necropsy you know we sent them out for histology they were all over inside the animal so fre any fresh water no matter what any fresh water strong enough to have affected them inside the tissue would have killed the clam it, 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 is your observation, both of you, that um, it's just harder these days to keep clams? And, and uh, if so, is that due to the way they've been shipped or the way they've been raised? Julian's shaking his head. Yeah, no, it, it's, uh, I think everybody who falls in love with clams and tries to collect them and, you know, have a nice clam tank falls into this same pattern of experience. And it's not just now. It's, it's always been a problem. Uh, clams do carry disease. It's just like being a new hobbyist and you go out and you buy the pretty fish and they break out with ick or ordinium or something else. And, you know, it's like dominoes. You have a healthy tank, you add this one fish, boom, they all go. Same thing happens with clams. And so what I have done as a result is, is to, if I want to have a lot of clams, then, you, you know, I must quarantine them. You, you, if you buy two or three clams all together, you can put them all together. You know, you're, you, you're taking that chance. But if you've got an aquarium and you've got one clam in that display aquarium, you cannot buy a new clam and put it in that display aquarium. You're, you'd be taking too big of a risk. Uh, so you want to have it in a separate display aquarium literally for months to make sure it's stable, healthy, okay before you would ever put it together with the other. And that's what I do. Interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah, I used to uh, I used to love to keep clams, but um, it just seems like the last few years I um, have not had a lot of success and, and um, I've stayed away from them. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it started, we used to have a lot of clams, um, and then we got a shipment of confiscated clams from Vietnam. Yeah. And we added those, like Julian said, they had disease and, we started to lose all our clams after that. Yeah, got to avoid. Who knows? Maybe there's a link between LED and no UV <laughs> in these clams. I, I think I've given you guys a, a because, several good topics to cover in your next volume of uh, the Reef Aquarium. So that'll. Well, I'm only half. I'm only half joking because you know, uh, giant clams are usually found in pretty shallow water, and they they like that yeah. UV. Yes. Could be something to it. So who knows? Who knows? Could be something to it. Could, all right, gentlemen. Um, it would be. Really Hey, there was that other question though at the bottom. Did you want to ask that which, one? Uh, which last question? Acclimating oh, corals. Oh, okay, yeah. If you guys, I would love to uh, hear your thoughts on that in terms of whether or not it is necessary to acclimate SPS or LPS when you get uh, a shipment, you know, overnight. Can you? Um, do you need to temp temperature acclimate them? Do you need to drip acclimate them, or can they come right out of the bag into the tank? Are they? Uh, self-acclimating organisms. Okay, I'm gonna jump on that one first. So number one, can they go right into the tank? Sure, but you're gonna bring the acropora eating flatworms and everything else with them. So watch <laughs> out. <laughs> um, number two, in general, corals do not need to be acclimated except for one thing, salinity. Um, I, you know, they, they're not super sensitive to slight changes in salinity, but you never know the place that you bought it from or if something happened in your tank that you weren't watching. If there's a really big difference in salinity, then you could have an issue going from bag directly into the tank. Generally, that's not going to be the case. Uh, temperature is not really uh, something to worry about. So even if you uh, get, uh, let's say, some acro frags and they come in at 65 degrees in the bag and you've got a tank that's 78 degrees you think they can go i'm not saying right out of the bag and into the display but uh they come right out of the bag and into a uh uh you know a bucket with that display tank water yeah i don't see a problem with that you know think about what corals are exposed to when the tide changes um you know they they get exposed to amazing heating um also, with upwelling, they, they can get really cold too. Yes, and we uh, we've done now uh, it, three shipments: two from Palau, or maybe three from Palau, and one from Australia of corals. 
large large heads of coral for uh, researchers working on coral spawning here. And, you know, they come in at 68, 72, and then we have to acclimate them. Um, we just do a drip acclimation with them. Basically, the reason we acclimate them is to what Julian alluded to, is that we treat them for any parasites they might be bringing right. in with them. So we have to give them, so that, that becomes an acclimation. But I have no qualms about taking them putting them directly in the tank. I do have a question for Julian, though, because I know that you've brought this up with freshwater dips. What about alkalinity? Do, should the alkalinity be close in the two waters? I don't have a, an opinion on it because I haven't tested that. Um, because I, because we know that if you bump the alkalinity in your system too quickly, you can cause you know, yeah. a tip burn, bleaching, right. all kinds of different things. And I know when we're dipping our, if we're dipping corals in a freshwater dip or clams, that we should have the alkalinity should be pretty close to the tank's alkalinity. Right. You want to put a, a buffer or something in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that would might be something that, you know, unless unless you have a really bad supplier. Your alkaline, their alkalinity should be, should be pretty, pretty close, close to yours, unless you're running your tank unusually high or low. So what I'm, what I'm hearing yeah. from you guys is that um, not necessary to float bags with corals in a tank to stabilize that temperature. P perhaps it's a good idea to drip acclimate to at least make sure the salinity is okay and potentially alkalinity. And it's easy enough to test the salinity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you, should be, you should be testing the water the corals right. come in to yeah. see what you're getting. Right. Yes. Yeah, we get that with we, we we get really sometimes surprised when with fish suppliers, you know, when we get our fish in what the salinity of that water is. And we have to do a quick, you know, quick uh, adjustment of our tank because the salinity comes in really low, much lower than we were expecting. Interesting. All right, gentlemen. Well, listen, I think um this was a lot of uh, a lot of fun. I uh, I certainly enjoyed it, and I know the viewers out there did as well. Do you guys have any uh, final thoughts before we uh, sign off on the live stream? I wasn't planning to have final <laughs> thoughts. It's a never-ending story. That's yeah, it. Could be a lot of final thoughts. <laughs> yeah. So this photo that's uh, behind me here is actually a photo in our in our big coral tank, and this is uh, the shallow what we call the shallows. The water is about maybe Gorgeous. two feet at the deepest, Beautiful. and and we are working on putting up a live webcam in there. So we oh. have a cam in there right now that we just are viewing in house to test it out. So you'll be able to watch uh, all the fish and the corals and the mainly the anemones that are in there there and giant clams. If you log in online, there's going to be a URL. You're going to promote that on social media when it's ready. Sky yeah. Art Aquarium. Oh yeah, you can yeah. have mates in there too. Oop. Mermaids? Oh, hopefully not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not if I have anything. Stepping to do. on the clams. Yeah. Julian, I sent you that photo, so you should have it. Great. You want to? You want to Skype together? We can okay. do that too. Well, gentlemen, listen. I, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, it was a uh, it was a thrill for me, and and hopefully we could have you uh, back on to talk about more uh, interesting topics in the future. That would be awesome. It, it, I look forward to that. It's uh, always a, a pleasure, Keith, and, and a great opportunity. Thanks for thinking of, the, of this. And Charles, so nice. <laughs> you see, I'm getting the band Bugs back together. Get, get excited, you know. Yeah, and, Keith, I just want to echo what Julian said, too. It's really been a pleasure. I haven't done very many of these. You know, I think you're the first person to reach out to do these with me. So I really appreciate that. And, Keeping me, my name sort of out there in the public eye, sort of, sort of speak, because I don't, I don't get out, I don't get out much anymore. Uh, but so it's always nice to uh, sit back and kick back and think about these things, because you know Julian and I and and others, Mike Paletta, Sanjay, Joy, Ulu, you know everybody, you know just hobbyists in general, over a couple of beers and just discussing these very things that we just talked about. Um, it's always it's always intellectually stimulating. Well, me. you guys are uh, certainly you know as I mentioned at the beginning of the uh, the the, the, uh, the live stream, you've uh, you've had a big impact in terms of the way the uh, the uh, the aquarium industry, the hobby is today, and and uh, you know just to be able to to hear you guys talk and and uh, bounce some questions off you and hear your ideas, it's uh, invaluable. And I think in a, in an age where you have a lot of opinions out there and a lot of different types of information, not all being uh, concrete and with as much uh, behind it in terms of the experience that you guys have i think it's very refreshing 
to have this sort of dialogue with two veterans like yourself. So I want to thank you very much on behalf of all the people that are out there viewing. Thanks. But um, so, all right, folks, listen, thank you so much for tuning in. And um, I want to thank again, Julian and Charles for, for being on the live stream. I also want to thank the sponsors, Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine for supporting the show. Thanks for the folks uh, out there with the super chats. Really appreciate it. And uh, one uh, note, uh, all episodes of Wrapping with Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. So if you want to check out the replay on those platforms, please do so. My next lot. And don't forget, TRA4, GoFundMe page. <laughs> We've already got five bucks. Two little fishies will be setting it up soon. Yes. Keep your yeah. eyes open. Yes. We've already got $9.99 from the uh, Super Chat. All right. <laughs> We're on All the right. way. But uh, That'll pay for yes, coffee. Yes, or a couple of beers, or maybe one beer, I guess, depending on where you go. But um, <laughs> So my next live stream is going to be next Thursday, February 10th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, back on the regular Thursday schedule with uh, Moki Chow, a.k.a. the Inappropriate Reefer. And you could also check out all the upcoming guests on my website, reefbum.com slash rapping dash with dash reefbum. Until what makes them inappropriate? <laughs> you'll have to tune in next week, oh, Charles, to find out. All right. I'll wrap it in. <laughs> I want to find out. He's a great guy. Yeah. Anyway, listen, uh, everybody uh, be safe, be well.